I want you to open your Bibles, please, to Psalms. Psalms 139. We'll be, uh, we'll be looking at that particular song, at uh, Psalm, rather, at the appropriate time. Psalm 139. There's a well-known book written by J.I. Packer entitled Knowing God. Great book, wonderful book. In this book, the writer chronicles his own lifetime journey in knowing more deeply and intimately the God that he worshiped so formally on Sundays. His argument is, we're there on Sunday, it's all so formal, it's you know, a system and you know, and he wanted to know God more deeply, more intimately. And he writes about his, this spiritual journey in this uh, particular book. Of course, he's not the first person to undertake such a task. People in every age are hungry to know the being behind creation, the spirit that speaks to us through the mouth of the prophets and shows his mighty hand on Resurrection Sunday. Nowhere is this yearning more evident than in the poignant 139th Psalm of David. I want to begin by reading a few opening verses. David writes, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. How wonderful it must be to know God as this man knew God. What a blessing to have the Lord fill so much of your life and have such an intimate knowledge of his ways. This man saw God's presence in his own actions, his everyday movements, as well as all of his thoughts. The presence of God in his life at every turn at once amazes, surprises, delights, and even overwhelms him with completeness. We continue reading verse seven. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay a hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. You know, when I first became a Christian, I nearly went crazy. I mean that. I nearly went out of my mind. I had always lived my life in my own way, according to my own terms, according to the beat that I set for my life. I had what is referred to as a flexible conscience. Things were wrong if I got caught. Actions were bad if I couldn't shake the guilty feeling that came with them after a week or so. In one way or another, I broke every commandment and at times either laughed at God or cursed Him or ignored Him if that was more convenient. Of course, this behavior led me deeper and deeper into sinfulness, further into a darkness that surpassed even what I thought were my own limits. Have you ever been there in your life and said to yourself, I am now at a place that I I never thought that even I would go to. And then one day something momentous happened. Call it inspiration or insight or providence, or as my son Paul likes to say, a moment of clarity broke through. I still remember that moment as if it were yesterday, even though it happened over 40 years ago. I was sitting on the floor in my bedroom 
It was a windy, rainy summer day and all of a sudden everything I had been thinking about on that day vanished and one shining thought pierced my heart. I realized that Jesus was God. <laughs> I know, sounds dumb, doesn't it? All of a sudden it, it just came upon me. It was like plugging in a lamp and turning it on. Oh, Jesus, He's God. This Jesus I had learned about in catechism class as a young Catholic boy in Catholic school. This, this Jesus I sang songs about at Christmas time. This Jesus whose name I used in jokes. I remember I had a joke about Jesus on the cross. Imagine the blasphemy. This Jesus was God himself. Not, not, not like God, not a, a godly person, not a teacher about God, not a representative or a God-like icon. He was God himself. And this flash of realization was followed by two years of searching, religious trial and error, and travel across Canada and parts of the United States. Now this might seem like a no-brainer to you, but eventually I began to read the Bible in my search for truth and understanding. You see, in Catholic Quebec in the 1950s, you were taught that you couldn't really understand religious things, and to try to do so would lead to insanity. And if you read the Bible, uh, that would absolutely guarantee your confusion. I mean, that's what we were taught. Even though Bible, the Bible teaches exactly the opposite thing, right? Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.15, from an early age, right, you have known the holy writings which are able to make you wise unto salvation. That was, that was the trajectory. The innocent, the foolish, the ignorant began to read God's word and with a constant reading of God's word with time, they began to become wise and ultimately wise unto, unto salvation. It didn't go the other way around. You read the Bible and you get dumber and darker and more ignorant, uh-uh. That's what I was taught. My study of the Bible led me to obey the gospel on a uh, cold, dark November night, 1977. I was baptized into Christ and began my first few steps as a new Christian. And this is when my troubles really began. Huh. I thought I had trouble before. <laughs> I thought when I when I'm going to be baptized and become a Christian boy, everything's going to fall into place. You see, up until then, I, used, I, used to, uh, I was used to leading my own life in the way that I chose. Um, open when I wanted it that way and closed and private when, I, when it suited me. But all of a sudden, however, it wasn't my life anymore. It was God's life and He was everywhere just like David explains in this psalm. I couldn't hide my evil deeds. I couldn't cover over my bad words. Even what was in my heart was open to his scrutiny and this lack of privacy or secrecy nearly drove me mad. He knows everything. He's aware of every thought. I wanted some space. I wanted to be left alone. I wanted to be somewhere where God was not. But he wouldn't let me. He wouldn't allow it. I have to say that I believe that this is how he broke my sinful spirit. This is how John's words in 1 John 3, 9 came true in my life. John said, no one who is born of God, okay, Christian, no one who is born of God practices sin. In other words, no one who's born of God, no Christian enjoys the practice of sin. Boy, what way can I get in trouble today? You know, which way can I break God's commands today? Which way can I live immorally today? 
because his seed abides in him, the word is in you. And he cannot sin. It doesn't mean you can't stumble or fall. It means I can no longer sin with enjoyment. I can no longer sin without feeling guilty about it. I can no longer contemplate sin and simply enjoy the contemplation of it anymore. That's what he means. And why? Because he is born of God because the spirit is within him, because God is following every thought and every step every day. All of a sudden, it wasn't my life anymore. It was his life. Because of his ever presence in my life, because I just couldn't get away from him, I couldn't sin anymore like I used to, like I wanted to. Not that I, I didn't sin, but I couldn't sin with pleasure, with freedom, with calculation. Sin became the aberration in my life. Repentance became a new way of life. His continual presence became the goal. Because, because He was there, his light filled every corner of my dark world so that I couldn't hide from him anymore. And so to save my sanity and to save my life, I allowed him in willingly. I accepted the reality of God's presence and holiness into my dark and dreary life. And do you know what happened? I started to like it. This thing that I was afraid of, this, this presence that I, that I had rejected and tried to run away from, I started to like it. I started to enjoy being in His presence. I began to love His presence, need His presence. I began to be unhappy when the power of His presence was less than at other times. Like the writer of the Psalm that we're reading, I no longer wanted to be anywhere where he was not welcome. I no longer wanted to be alone or private, but rather I sought him out for an even closer relationship. Of course, <laughs> he always knew me. He always knew me even before that rainy day on the floor in my bedroom. I know that he waited all of those years for me to invite him in. Let's go back to our Psalm and read. David writes, for you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance and in your book were written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. I didn't believe and I don't believe that God just chooses you. I believe that the Bible teaches that God chose Christ and sent him to us to reveal himself and you either choose Christ or reject him. This is why Peter, after preaching the gospel to the crowd in Jerusalem on Pentecost Sunday, continues to appeal to them. In Acts chapter two, he said, uh, Luke writes, and with many other words, he, meaning Peter, solemnly, uh, testified and kept on exhorting them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Peter revealed who Jesus was, the Christ, and he exhorted them to choose to believe. Some, about 3,000, did believe and were baptized but many thousands of others who were there on that day also chose not to believe. 
also chose to reject the offer that Peter was making in Jesus' name. So I repeat, God didn't choose me over someone else, but He knew me. You see the difference? He didn't choose me, but He knew me. He knew me when I was a, a little boy sitting on the stoop in front of the boarding house where I lived, singing songs about St. Joseph and St. Mary as a little Catholic boy. He knew me. He knew me when I, to be smart, to impress fellow teenagers, I would repeat this awful, awful joke about Jesus on the cross. He knew me. He heard me. He knew in advance, because he knows all things, that when the time came to choose, I would choose Christ. I, I, am, so, I am so glad that he gives men and women the revelation of Christ and the power to choose. And you know why? Because choosing Christ, choosing to believe, is the only thing that actually belongs to me. I have nothing else. I have nothing else. God has given me everything. The only thing that actually belongs to me is the power to choose. It's the only thing I own. It's the only thing I control. And therefore, it's the only thing that I can actually offer to God. He knew what I would choose on that day. He didn't force me, but he knew me. He anticipated it. The angels, who by the way, didn't know, they held their breath, wondering what I would do. But he knew, and when the heavens rejoiced at my decision, he received joyfully the only gift I would ever give to him in all of eternity, and that is, my choice to believe in Jesus Christ. The only thing that was truly mine to give. How wonderful is this knowledge, this truth, this thing that happened between me and God. David says, how precious also are your thoughts to me. Oh God, how vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked. Oh God, depart from me therefore, men of bloodshed, for they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. That was me. I fall asleep at night to this day, joyfully thinking of the consequences of that choice and the awesome power that enabled it, knowing that with that choice, I went from night to day. And as David says, he says, <clears throat> do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. What does someone strive for when sin and this world no longer interests you? Well, you strive for holiness. You no longer strive for sin. You strive for holiness which reminds me of a, a person, a brother in Christ that I know, Guy Hammond, many years ago. I haven't seen him in a couple of years, but Guy Hammond was a, a practicing homosexual from an early age, from the age, his teenage years. 
I don't mean he just had same sex attraction. I mean, he practiced homosexuality. He was in the lifestyle. He had a boyfriend. He was living with someone. That was his life. He had been raised in the church. His parents obviously were mortified, were hurt, sorrowed, felt helpless. And Guy tells me of his, not conversion, he already was a believer, but very much like me, he just couldn't get away from God. He just couldn't go to a place where God was not. Even in the things that were evil that he was doing, he couldn't blot out that God was there and knew about this. He finally repented and cried out to God to help him and sought out help. Believe it or not, I know that in the media we, we don't tend to advertise this, but there is help. He sought it out, he accepted it, he worked with it. Long story, but eventually he married happily, had several children with his wife, and he began a ministry to help others. The ministry entitled Strength and Weakness Ministries. And what he does is try to duplicate what happened in his life, helping other men and women who have struggled with same sex attraction, or other type of sexual dysfunction to help them become healed spiritually and healed sexually. He's a, a speaker, he goes everywhere to speak. He was invited to Rutgers University and there were, you know, there were marches and there were riots and they didn't want him to speak and all the gay groups on campus, you know, were denouncing him, but eventually he, uh, he got to speak and there were thousands of people there. <clears throat> and one part of his speech really struck me. He said to them, and many of them in the crowd obviously were sympathetic to homosexuality and that lifestyle. He said, brothers and sisters, I'm like you. To this day, I feel that attraction. To this day, that temptation to that style of living still draws me at times. I want you to understand, he says, that my choice is not between homosexuality and heterosexuality. This isn't the choice that I face. The choice that I face is homosexuality or holiness. That's the choice that I face. That's the choice that I make every single day. How will I live today? As a homosexual? Or will I live as a holy man of God? That's my choice. The crowd was hushed. No more yelling. No more screaming. No more denunciation. I mean, there wasn't a standing ovation at the end, but there was polite applause. Polite applause for a man who had been through a terrible experience and had come out the other side wounded, hurt, weakened, but not defeated, not defeated. What excites a person when one becomes, as Paul says in Colossians chapter three, verse five, dead to immorality, you become zealous for God as he did. You become zealous for God. This is what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 6, 24, when he says, you cannot serve two masters. If you're excited and zealous and grasping for the place that you have in this world, for the rewards and pleasures and recognition that this world gives you, you cannot be zealous for God. You can't do it because this world is in opposition to the next world. Oh yes, you, you can believe that there is a God, even practice your religion, but zeal for God, this is out of reach for you. We've not only got one life, excuse me, we only have one life, and we either devote it on the altar of this world, 
or we pour it out before God in expectation of the next world. Listen to what Jesus himself says. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. Many think that Jesus is talking about death at the end of our lives. You know, you have a heart attack or old age and you die. But this is not the case. Jesus is talking about death to this world before we actually die in this world so we can have life after this world. David says it well when he declares that the enemies of God are his enemies, that he hates what God hates, that he fights against those who fight against God. Oh, to have this kind of zeal for the Lord today. He gave no quarter. He was not compliant. He was not an apologist for those who openly opposed God, speaking of David. He denounced sinners. He opposed their influence. How much more effective we would be as Christians if we openly opposed evil, if we spoke out against God haters and those who ridicule Christ by denouncing them and pronouncing judgment on them, not doing so self-righteously or spitefully, but with righteous indignation born out of pure zeal for God, seen as a fiery power that tears down every godless idea and every blasphemer from their proud and arrogant stand. If zeal for God would be our mission statement and corporate logo, there'd be no mistaking who we are and what we stand for as individual Christians as well as a church. In verse 23 and 24, David says the following, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Whose heart is God searching at this moment? He knows you, just like he knows me. He knows you. How will you respond? It's your choice to answer in some way or another, and you make the choice to believe in Jesus and obey him in repentance and baptism, to begin pouring out your life in zeal for God, leaving behind complacency and worldliness. Remember, you choose this, you refuse this, you have the ability and the freedom to give it or to hold it back. Brothers and sisters, friends, guests, I encourage you to choose wisely as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.